I'm Sarah Ellis and this is the Squiggly Careers Ask the Expert podcast series. Each week we focus on a skill that we think is particularly relevant at work right now and interview an expert from around the world about how we can develop these skills for ourselves. This episode is the final in our first series and I talked to the amazing Amy Edmondson. She's a Harvard professor whose work really concentrates on something called psychological safety. We'd love to know whether you'd like to hear a second series, and if you would, which skills and guests would be on your wish list. You can get in touch with us on Instagram where we're at AmazingIf, or just email us Helen and Sarah at AmazingIf.com. And if you've enjoyed the series, a rate, review, subscribe, share would all be brilliant. They make a massive difference. We read them all, and honestly, it's the best part of our week. Our Ask the Expert series is supported by the BP UK Foundation. They're a charity whose purpose is to help people live longer, healthier, happier lives. They fund practical projects which have a positive impact on people's mental well-being, including well-being workshops for educators, working with minds to empower better mental health in young people through online resources, and funding community mental well-being projects. I really hope you enjoy listening to today's episode, and I'll be back at the end to let you know what's coming next and how you can get in touch with us. Amy, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So Amy, perhaps for our listeners who are new to the idea of psychological safety or have perhaps heard about it, but maybe don't have lots of knowledge about exactly what it means in a work context, perhaps you could just start by describing for us what it is and why it matters at work. Psychological safety is a belief that I can bring my full self to work. It's a belief that I can speak up candidly with what I see, with my ideas, with my concerns, and even with my mistakes. I think the biggest reason that psychological safety matters is that if people are not able to speak up, you are at risk for preventable failures and for failures of innovation. So there's really the preventing the bad and the not realizing the good aspects of this. So no company can afford to have preventable failures or a lack of innovation. And psychological safety is critical to both. And it's so interesting because as you describe both of those things, it makes complete sense. And rationally, I would imagine every leader should be nodding their head thinking, of course, we want to make sure that we anticipate preventable failures. I would imagine most people would recognize that all of the wisdom doesn't sit with the people who are the most senior in an organization. But from everything I've read, certainly achieving psychological safety is tough. It's difficult because it requires often organizations to maybe shift the way that they think and individuals to maybe think in a new way. What do you observe typically kind of gets in the way of something that I think we would all hope that organizations would work with lots of psychological safety? You said that so well. It's like people intellectually or rationally recognize that, of course, I want and need to hear from my employees. But what they don't recognize is that an act of not speaking up is invisible, meaning that mm-hmm. you can't know, you know, in, in, in the moment, you can't know if someone had a great idea that they didn't share. It's just not, you know, written across their forehead. <laughs> you can't know if someone had a concern about a potential threat to the business that they didn't share. Again, it's invisible. And and so there's this real asymmetry about speaking up. When someone speaks up and let's say it's not well received, that creates a lasting impression that's you know largely bad for the person who spoke up. Whereas when they didn't speak up, no one around or above them is mm. the wiser. They don't know it happened. And the person just skates by another moment without harm. When you see organizations or team leaders who are doing this really well, is role modeling particularly important? Because I would imagine you talked about consequences being really memorable. So if you do speak up or if you do make a mistake or if you perhaps talk to your leader about a risk and it isn't well received, you kind of really feel the negative consequences. But if actually those behaviors are both encouraged and then when they do happen, people see lots and lots of examples of that being very positively received. Does that have like a knock-on effect, almost like a virtuous cycle of the more this happens, the more it encourages it? Do those two things correlate? Yes, absolutely. And it's role modeling 
is the critical concept, I think. You know, if you want others to engage in a behavior, say openness, say curiosity, learning, courage, you've got to do the same things. And mission critical is responding in what I call a productive way to say bad things. Acknowledge and appreciate that someone brought something that they thought was relevant. So it's, thanks for bringing that up. And maybe something next along the lines of, here's how I'm looking at it. Leaders have a primary responsibility to develop, educate others, but I may be missing something, right? And and so there's always a, you're role modeling a learning stance because a learning stance is essentially the only wise stance in a changing world. And do you think that requires leaders to become more comfortable with being vulnerable? I think the less sophisticated, less wise leader fails to recognize that vulnerability is a strength, which sounds like an oxymoron, but it is, you know, it's only when you're strong enough and confident enough to be vulnerable that you really are aware of reality in a sense, because we're all vulnerable. That's just a given. We're vulnerable Mm -hmm. to the next thing that's coming around the corner. We don't have a crystal ball And so being wise enough to model that vulnerability is just a brilliant way to help others do the same. What can organizations do? What can a leader do? What kind of actions do you see people taking where they increase the psychological safety of their teams or their organizations? Well, I think the most important thing is being open and continuously reminding people about the nature of the challenges we face. What leaders must do is what I call frame the work. What's the work that we do? Let's say we're working on developing new products in our company that will delight customers. So we're constantly saying, hey, this is the kind of work for which, you know, failures along the way are quite literally mission critical for success. Intellectually, anyone who works on innovation projects understands that, but emotionally, it's still hard Each and every one of us prefer success to failure. So (laughs) the leader is framing the work, saying we need to take those risks. We need to experiment. It's not always going to work out. Now, you might think, oh, I could say that once and I'm done. Not so. It has Mm -hmm. to be said over and over and over to keep overriding those instincts, those instincts that lead us human beings to want to look good or to get it right the first time or to be perfect, however you want to put it. So it's really just continually calling attention to the messy, challenging, wonderful reality (laughs) that we're up against. I was thinking about which aspect or dimension of psychological safety do I find the hardest? And for me personally, it's about making mistakes. So for me, it was, I really don't like making mistakes, but actually the consequences are that then I'm not giving other people the opportunity to help me solve it quicker. Other people might have some really good answers here to contribute. And actually I'm being quite selfish in terms of keeping this to myself and maybe trying to hide that mistake or squirrel away and fix it. And so I think thinking through consequences certainly was a useful technique for me to to just push me in those areas that I found particularly difficult. Exactly right. In a sense, you're trying to sell yourself on doing something hard and you never, no one would ever buy anything if they didn't see some value in it. And so you're sort of reminding yourself that even though this might be hard and feel like it costs something of me right now emotionally, it's worth it. That the value I will get from it will pay for the cost and then some. And The reason why, as you describe it, you have to keep reminding yourself is because you will keep going back to your instincts. Psychological safety is about lowering that threshold to a healthy level where, yeah, we'll get it wrong sometimes. That's fine. We won't be wasting tons and tons of times on things we haven't thought about at all, but we won't confuse interpersonal risk with business risk. But, you know, yeah. interpersonal risks just don't matter as much as our brains tell us they do. Whereas, you know, business risks and human safety risks do matter. And I can't tell you how many, I guess I have about 20 different case studies in the book, maybe 10 of which are companies where because people weren't willing to take interpersonal risk, the companies ended up with, you know, abysmal business risk. 
that were preventable. I'm interested in the current environment where the world has changed very quickly and individuals, leaders and organisations are all having to adapt and innovate pretty quickly to respond to kind of where we are. Can you almost start to see organisations really thinking about this already or is it a bit too soon? So organisations are thinking about this. It's not as straightforward as it first sounds, right? Because psychological safety is indeed an absence of a certain kind of fear, but it's not an absence of all fear. And so I like to make a distinction between interpersonal fear, you know, where I'm primarily worried about what you'll think of me if Mm -hmm. I say something stupid. And let's say COVID-related fear, which is, you know, a a very sensible fear of a dangerous virus. And the good news, if you can find any good news, the good news about COVID-related fear is that it's completely discussable. It's not embarrassing to say, yes, I'm really anxious. When I read about psychological safety, I feel like it's one of those areas where you will always be work in progress. You need to consistently think about it. It never goes away. I don't think you, there's no ticking the box. (laughs) No, you're absolutely right, because it's human nature to worry about what others think of us, and that will always be with us. And so it will always take sort of proactive effort to make that worry secondary to the worry about the mission. What we really want is for people coming to work with most of their focus, most of their ingenuity, most of their energy focused on the mission, not on the mission of looking good. So if somebody has been listening today and thinks, wow, that's really fascinating. I'm sort of, I'm not sure if I've got psychological safety in in my organization or what can I do next as a leader to really kind of think about it? Where would you suggest a leader start? So if they're thinking, this has been fascinating. I buy into this. I hope I do some of this. Where do you kind of suggest people start in terms of, is it about getting feedback from their employees in terms of what their employees think? Is it about starting with yourself or a bit of both? You know, I I think it's a bit of both. So here I would say first, look around, you know, reflect on the last week, say, or, and ask yourself, honestly, are you hearing mostly good news? Are you hearing, you know, lots of thumbs up, high five, yeah, everything's going great? Mm -hmm. Or are you hearing a healthy mix of what's working and what's not working? If you're not hearing about problems or mistakes, you're definitely not getting the full story. And that may be a problem. Then look around, you know, how energized do interactions between people seem, right? There are people kind of letting loose and just jumping in. And do you feel that energy? Do you feel a sort of healthy sense of not taking themselves too seriously, of being willing to laugh and willing to take risks? Because to a certain extent, this kind of environment is palpable, right? You, you sort of know it when you see it. So that's kind of step one. Another step is you can use a survey. You can, you can do that. And then I think maybe the third best thing is to just go ask. It's a little tricky. You know, if people are feeling unsafe, yeah. they're not going to, they're in a bind. They're not going to say, yeah, I feel unsafe. But you can ask good questions. And this, I think, is the most powerful tool you have. And I, I define a good question as one that is, first, you don't know the answer to it yet. But second, it's focused on an issue that matters, you know, a project, a timeline, a topic. And it gives people room to respond, forces thought. So you might say, you know, I'd love to have your ideas about this project. That's a good question, right? And you do them the honor of listening. That is really useful. So just to finish for today, we ask all of our guests for their best piece of career advice. So it could be advice you've been given that's really stuck with you or just your own words of wisdom that you'd like to share with everyone. Well, I think my best piece of career advice is never pick a job for pay alone. Never pick among two options that, you know, one you might like better, but the other pays more. Resist, because in the long run, doing what you love and what you're good at and where you can make the most contribution will lead you to the most career success. And short-term, long-term financial decisions are often misleading, right? A few more dollars this year may end up quite the opposite over the long run. So do what you love, 
do where you feel you can make a contribution and trust the process uh, to sort of keep taking you where your next stretch uh, (laughs) opportunity will be. That's very much our mindset and attitude with all things squiggly careers is that, you know, we're all going to be working for a long time. So let's, let's enjoy it and let's explore, let's be curious. And we talk about optimizing for learning. So just pick opportunities based on where you think you're going to learn the most. That's brilliant advice. So Amy, thank you so much for talking to us today. I feel that the work that you've done is so powerful it has real impact in organizations it's something when we work with any organization we are always talking about so thank you for your work we think it's amazing and we will continue to advocate for it everywhere we go and really appreciate your time today thank you so much thank you so much for having me and for advocating for the work i hope you enjoyed today's episode and thank you for listening As always, you can get in touch with us via email. We're just Helen and Sarah at amazingif.com or find us on Instagram where we're at amazingif. Thanks so much and we'll speak to you again soon. Bye for now.